president, the United States' position that preemptive self-defense should be invoked as a rationale for war. The faculty members will represent the United Kingdom position that preemptive self-defense should not have been invoked, and legal authority rests solely on previous UN Security Council resolutions. I repeat, this is not a question of whether force against Iraq is appropriate. Neither the United States nor the uh, UK dispute that point. The question is whether the legal rationale suggested by the United States is appropriate. Representing the United States are 2L Mayor Patel and 3L Rance Almond. Representing the United Kingdom is Professor Byers, director of the JDLM program, and who teaches international law, European Union law, and the current issues class. His partner is Professor Silliman, executive director of the Center of Law, Ethics, and National Security at the law school, and whose courses include national security law and military justice. In an Oxford debate, the winner is chosen by the House, and they vote with their feet. On these two doors, down here we have the British flag, and up there we have the American flag. At the conclusion of the debate, based on what you have heard from the debaters, walk out the door of the country's position that you agree with. Thank you. I now call this House to order. Mr. Patel, you may proceed for a speech of not greater than eight minutes. Thank you. Madam Speaker, members of the House, the question before you is whether preemptive self-defense should be invoked against Iraq, Saddam Hussein's Iraq. And throughout this argument, I want you to keep that fact in mind. Saddam Hussein's Iraq is a regime at war either with its neighbors or its own people. And throughout this war, it has broken the basic rules dear to all decent nations, has engaged in torture, and has gassed civilians, has deceived inspectors, and defied the Security Council. That is what preemptive self-defense has been evoked against. And it has been given far more chances than it ever gave to any of its victims. <clears throat> I will present two arguments to explain why self-defense is appropriate. First, to show a legal background that indeed self-defense and preemptive self-defense has a background in customary international law. And second, an argument a little bit more along the lines of policy to show why this is an appropriate case in this situation. In regards to my first point, preemptive self-defense has long been recognized in international law. But perhaps the best elucidation comes between the United Kingdom and the United States itself in a case called Caroline. In the Caroline case, a British army had destroyed a ship on American territory. And through this exchange and concern, a rationale had come out for when war, preemptive self-defense, is justified. You must have a case where you have instant and overwhelming fear. And you have little choice and means and little time for deliberation. The doctrine of Caroline was later affirmed by most states to be customary international law. And the UN Charter did not eliminate this doctrine. The rapporteur for the committee in charge of drafting Article 51 noted that Article 51 did not change the customary international law on preemptive self-defense. Furthermore, an eminent former uh, justice of the International Court of Justice, Sir Claude Waldock, has stated, quote, it would be a travesty of the purposes of the charter to compel a defending state to allow its assailant to deliver the first and perhaps fatal blow to read Article 51 otherwise is to protect the aggressor's right to the first strike, unquote. The head of the drafting committee for Article 51 also noted that the article requirement of armed attack did not foreclose preeminent self-defense. Indeed, the equally authentic French text does not use the word armed attack. It uses the word armed aggression. There's clearly arguments here that preemptive self-defense survives. Jeffrey Hoon, the British Defense Secretary has remarked himself that preemptive self-defense from the Caroline incident still survives to this day. Now, not only do we need to look at the legislative history, we can look to practice. In 1967, Israel was surrounded by Arab armies. The Straits of Tehran had been closed to it. And the armies had been put under a common leadership. Israel did not wait first for the armies to cross its lines. It had defended itself and attacked first in Israel. A country with a rocky relationship with the international community was not condemned for this. Because states realize, deep down, that self-defense is vital. We do not allow the UN Charter to become a suicide pact. And that is key. Self-defense did not vanish. Now when we look here, 
preemptive self-defense. The facts do match the situation. We've set up a law that has a high standard. It requires a requirement of a serious threat, one that is building. And weapons of mass destruction pose that threat. Now, we saw in Israel that tanks smashing at the border could invoke self-defense. I assure you, weapons of mass destruction can do the same. And while tanks can be recalled, the Kurds at Halabja can tell you that poison gas cannot. Saddam Hussein is a threat. He is the only head of state that has been condemned by the United Nations Security Council as an aggressor. He has used chemical weapons on innocent civilians. Ali Hassan al-Majid, a leader and cohort in this criminal regime, when told that 200,000 Kurds were killed by it, remarked that was an exaggeration. Only 100,000 had been killed. A regime that can shrug off 100,000 dead is a danger to international peace and security. And weapons of mass destruction in the hands of the Iraqi regime pose an immediate and overwhelming danger to the United States and other states as well. Now, Iraq has been given numerous opportunities to show that it will clear its name and act as a responsible member of the international community. And each day it has been done that has been at a threat to the rest of international peace and security. Every day it possesses a weapon of mass destruction, it poses an immediate danger and has been given too many opportunities. To those who argue that the Iraqi regime is not going to attack a superpower, I beg to disagree. In 1993, the Iraqi regime tried to assassinate a former president, George Herbert Walker Bush, an American citizen. Now that attempt was foiled, but imagine if they had succeeded. That would have invited prompt and sudden retaliation, yet they risked it. The fact whether this regime's atrocities are reckless or deliberate, stupid or indifferent, makes no difference to its victims in the final analysis. The fact that we have foiled a plan of it in the past does not mean that we abrogate our right of self-defense now. I ask you to think of that po point very carefully. We foiled al-Qaeda on many instances before September 11th. But September 11th happened. We never abrogated our right of self-defense. This is not a broad principle we are invoking here. This is a narrow one against a narrow state. There are few states that can claim to be of the type of Iraq is a habitual lawbreaker, one that engages in aggression, and one that refuses to comply with means. It had an opportunity to clear its name and has failed to do so. Weapons of mass destruction are an overwhelming threat, and in Saddam Hussein, they are inevitable. We need not do so. The law is on our side, and the facts demand that we apply self-defense. In regards to my second point, invoking self-defense is a wise policy as well. Some would argue that creating this defense would mean that states will seek weapons of mass destruction. I doubt it. As noted earlier, this is a narrow rule. If states don't behave like Iraq, they have nothing to fear. Only those states that act with disregard, that seek weapons of mass destruction, and violate international commitments have anything to fear. It's quite easy to make sure that this international law justification doesn't apply to you. Act responsibly. Act like a member of the international community that has respect for the others. Saddam Hussein's regime does not. It has nothing but contempt for the international community. Furthermore, this is not a new policy. The United States has confronted them on many cases before. Consider the Cuban Missile Crisis. Perhaps the first time the United States was seriously concerned about using war to control weapons of mass destruction. Now, although the language was different, the principle is the same. The US will not let gathering dangers come to us. We will take action. There we took a military blockade. Here Saddam Hussein has left us with no choice but war. He's refused all other methods. Some would argue that allowing legal loopholes will allow other countries to invoke it, such as India attacking Pakistan. India has lost 60,000 people in Kashmir in the last 12 years. I assure you, the fact that they found a legal, legal caveat right now will not determine whether they go to war. I think the fear of nuclear missiles staring down them is a little bit more of a concern. The basic issue is that war is expensive, and the other international laws still apply. The US is going to war here, not to destroy the Iraqi state, but to create a new Iraqi state and obey the international laws of occupation, such as Geneva IV. How many states do you know right now that are going to invoke self-defense and will rebuild a nation and set it free? Not many states are doing this. The United States is not abrogating international law. It is affirming it. We are not reinventing the wheel. We are bringing it up to speed. Invoking this defense also shapes customary international law. By invoking it, 
It puts the international community on notice that it will not let threats grow and develop quietly. Developing customary international law is not a bad thing. Through our attack on Afghanistan, we have shaped international law to show that states are responsible for terrorist groups that operate on its territory. And since then, numerous states have cracked down and monitor more groups such closely. Members of this House, Iraq is a clear and present danger to our security. And we need not wait for others to give approval. Invoking self-defense is not righteousness. It is a statement of truth. Thank you. Members of this House, you've heard some compelling and powerful statements, some of which were correct, some of which were not. I want to make it clear from the start that the British government views the regime of Saddam Hussein as one of the worst regimes in history. Indeed, it is our government which has led the condemnation of the human rights atrocities in Iraq, not the American government. It was our government that pushed for an intervention in Kosovo in 1999, not the American government. My colleague seems to wish to draw us into the position of defenders of Saddam Hussein. We are not defenders of Saddam Hussein. I regret his suggestion that we might be. What I want to do instead is to make it absolutely clear that our concern with the American position is based in large part upon the fact that there is a much better alternative argument, that you don't need to argue preemptive self-defense in order to remove Saddam Hussein. There is a perfectly good legal argument that does not have the very dangerous reciprocal policy consequences of the preemptive self-defense claim. So why argue preemptive self-defense if there's something that's much better both in law and in policy? And then having sketched out this alternative argument, I'm then going to demonstrate the weakness with the claim that preemptive self-defense is customary international law, at least the preemptive self-defense that's being claimed by the United States. And then my colleague, Professor Suleiman, will explain the very serious policy consequences of the American position and the very significant policy advantages of the British position. Now, the very good alternative argument, simply put, is based upon the clear language of Security Council resolutions, resolutions adopted by the international community acting under the executive power of the Security Council. In 1990, the Security Council adopted Resolution 678, authorizing all member states to use all necessary means to restore international peace and security into the region of Kuwait and Iraq. Clear authorization. The coalition in 1991 fought that war on the basis of Resolution 678. There is no time limitation on 678. In 1991, the Council adopted Resolution 687, the ceasefire resolution, which suspended the authorization in 678. Suspended the authorization. And it also required that Saddam Hussein's government accept the terms of 687, accept it as a treaty binding in international law. Now, in November of last year, of 2002, the United Nations Security Council unanimously adopted a resolution, Resolution 1441, where it found, it declared explicitly that Iraq was in material breach of 687. In material breach of 687. That means that it was in violation of 687 to such a serious degree that 687's suspension of 678 ceased to operate. 678 is operative today. In 1441, the Security Council also declared that Iraq would be in continuing breach unless it provided a full declaration of all its weapons of mass destruction and cooperated fully with the weapons inspectors and member states of the United Nations seeking to uphold these resolutions. Iraq did not do so. Hans Blix, 
the chief weapon inspector, reported on multiple occasions of Iraqi violations of Resolution 1441, most notably the presence of the El Samud II missiles, which had to be destroyed. They had to be destroyed because Iraq, by possessing them, was and continues to be in material breach of 1441. Therefore, there's clear Security Council authorization, and we, the British government, have sent our troops to war on that basis. We have no problem with that. So why invoke this alternative argument? Well, I don't know. The argument, quite simply, is that customary international law, the informal customary law that is built upon the practice and opinions of states, has somehow extended to the point that you can attack a country that is not immediately threatening you. We waited, the British and Americans, for four months after the adoption of 1441 before launching our war. Had there been an immediate threat, we would not have waited. The British government would not have put its citizens at risk by waiting four months if there was an immediate threat. And George W. Bush would have been in abdication of his <coughs> responsibilities as president if he had waited four months in the face of an immediate threat. There is no immediate threat here, at least not an immediate threat that falls within the traditional confines of customary international law. I've distributed a sheet around here. Some of you will have this, not all of you, because we have a larger audience than I expected. But the character of customary international law, what is customary international law? Well, Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice says that it's a general practice accepted as law, a general practice. The ICJ in 1950 said that what was required was a constant and uniform usage. In 1969, it required a very widespread and representative participation. That's what we need, a very widespread and representative participation in the claim in order for custom on this point to exist, as has been argued. Now, what is the state of customary international law? I'm going to put aside the question of the limitation of the 1945 UN Charter. For the purposes of argument, I'm going to focus on the pre-existing customary international law. The Caroline case, the Caroline case of 1837 and the letter of 1842 from Secretary of State Daniel Webster. And listen to the criteria, listen to the language put forward by an American Secretary of State. A necessity of self-defense, instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment of deliberation. My honorable opponent misled you. He said leaving little choice of means and little moment of deliberation. It doesn't say little in the letter from Daniel Webster. No choice of means and no moment of deliberation. Do not let yourself be misled. When President George W. Bush announced his new doctrine of extended preemptive self-defense last summer at West Point Military Academy, he went far beyond this language. He said, and I quote, we must take the battle to the enemy, disrupt his plans, and confront the worst threats before they emerge. No suggestion of a necessity that is instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment of deliberation. Indeed, he waited another six months before he ordered the attack on Iraq. This is not the Caroline doctrine that is being invoked here. So what do we do in the face of the claim made by our friends, our best friends, the Americans? Well, we look at state practice. We look for this general practice, this constant and uniform usage, this very widespread and representative participation. We look for that because, yes, customary international law can change. And what do we find? Almost no country in the last 100 years has invoked this doctrine of preemptive self-defense, with all respect to my opponent. Israel, in the Six-Day War, based its claim on the fact that there was a prior act of aggression, the closing of the Straits of Tehran that my opponent mentioned before the Israeli attack. Israel did not argue preemptive self-defense. 
It might have had a good factual situation for an argument of that kind, but it did not make it. It's remarkable. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, the President of the United States did not invoke preemptive self-defense. He argued Chapter 8 of the UN Charter, regional peacekeeping. He had a great factual situation. He did not make the argument. And it goes on and on and on. There is no general practice accepted as law. There is no constant and uniform usage, and certainly not a usage that extends as far as our opponents are arguing to a right of precautionary self-defense, allowing us to confront threats before they emerge. 1441 is there. We have the unanimous backing of the Security Council. We have clear language. We have authorization dating back to 1990 that continues in force today. And so I close. There is no international law in support of this claim. There is strong international law in support of our collective action in Iraq. Thank you. Madam Speaker and the House, defenders of the status quo, <laughs> while not known for my appearances at such venerable venues as Oxford University, the sound rooms of National Public Radio, or CNN, or even the courts of international jurisprudence, I do have the unparalleled recognition from the inhabitants of George's Garage and the respect of the uncanny jurists of the Wilson Center Courts. And similar to the rescued service member Jessica Lynch, I come from the no-nonsense hills of West Virginia where the realities of life rule the day. And so that introduction, I offer you not merely a legal, but a realistic justification for the Bush Doctrine of preemptive self-defense. <clears throat> the United States is properly and necessarily constructing a new wor world order through customary international law of preemptive self-defense. It's properly using customary international law as the vehicle to meet the threats of today. The most important query is not investi investigating the mere content of the law but rather investigating the process of lawmaking. The opposition would have you believe that we are to rely on the safe hands of France and the Security Council resolutions. Second, it's necessary. 9-11 challenged the assumptions of passive self-defense under the UN Charter. All the ICJ cases cited were previous to 9-11 and perhaps irrelevant. The propriety of using customary international law. It is where international law and international politics, politics meet. And at this fluid juncture, the US is seeking to provide its in interpretation of existing custom. But why should it do so here? Why not rely on the UN and the Security Council? Well, first, as a matter of policy, the Security, the Security Council has failed to act in the past and will likely fail to act in the future. And if the UN cannot act or is unwilling to act, individual, individual states must act. Relying on the Se Security Council is a mistake. During the Cold War, the Security Council was paralyzed, period. Deterrence was the rule of the day, not Security Council resolutions. In fact, we had to go around the Security Council in, in 1950 during the Korean conflict through Uniting for Peace resolutions. During the post-Cold War era, during the 1990s, Security Council failed to act in it in many important instances. First of all, in, and sadly in Rwanda, where a Hutu power sought to erase the memories of the Tutsis. It failed to act quickly in Sierra Leone, and Ekamog had to step up to the, t to the plate. And it failed to act in Kosovo in 1999, where NATO rose to the occasion to save ethnic Albanians from the mighty hand of Slovan Milosevic. As a matter of legal policy, the fluidity and adaptability of customary international law make it the proper vehicle, not the UN Security Council. It's not, customary international law is not limited to bureaucratic debates within UN charter institutions. Now, why these debates might be necessary and helpful norms governing economic trade become more of a hindrance and a danger in times of necessity and national security. The better vehicle for social normative change starts with state practice and opinion euros, which provides an amorphous structure needed to react rapidly to changing events. States merely act, and states merely respond to these actions. And thus, customary international law can fulfill the rational purpose of self-defense. It can give meaning to such terms as armed attack, imminence, and allow to fulfill the political purpose of protecting territorial sovereignty and protect the welfare of each, each nation's citizens. Also, as a matter of policy, it matches the legitimate with the lawful. 
example of later time justifications for acts of, of preemptive self-defense can be found in, in Israel's strike on the Ozerik nuclear factory in 1981. And, and justifications for legitimate actions of use of force can be found in, in the NATO intervention in Kosovo, which one of, my, uh, one of our uh, opposing colleagues uh, helped serve on a, a board that uh, justified that action. As a matter of politics, international law is based on principles of reciprocity. Thus, custom will be supported in this instance. Professor Byers has written that, uh, that the reciprocal benefit, or he suggested the reciprocal be benefit gained by states is not, is not to be gained. Uh, there's no reciprocal benefit to be gained by supporting preemptive self-defense. However, this notion of reciprocity is limited to a narrow meaning, spe specifically, if you get to do this, so, so do I. But I offer that there's another theory of reciprocity, which is, if you rub my back, I'll wash your car. In, in this instance, this, it's not the same material benefit that's, that's the bargain. It's exchange of different material interests. And so states will come to support our version of customary international law because they want to. And this is evidence of the coalition of the willing growing to the coalition of the growing. And states have, an, have a reciprocal benefit in the fact that they want to meet the threats of today. No state wants to be able to say that they cannot meet international terrorist threats. I mean, even the French would, would rather meet an imminent threat in the face of, 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 the face of Paris blowing up. And they might, they, might, they might argue, and they, and they have argued, but the reciprocal benefit might give states an excuse to attack other states. But that is unlikely, considering that law-abiding states respond rationally to deterring factors such as nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, and alliances. Thus, because of this primitive self-defense, we're not likely to see China attack Taiwan, because Taiwan has conventional weapons and has an alliance with a nuclear, a nuclear superior opponent of China, the United States. Which leads me to the, my next point, the necessity for preemptive self-defense. In the face of 9-11 and the road to war in Iraq, we are exposed, these two events expose the assumptions of passive self-defense under the UN Charter. First, it exposed the instrumental inadequacy of the Security Council itself. It's based on a flawed power formula where, the U where France is given veto power. This, this is somehow some kind of mistake in my mind. I mean, this was 1945 when this occurred. It exposed the paradox of imminence and deterrence. The deterrent effect is diminished when the magnitude of in, and imminence of the first aggressive strike could either destroy completely the ability to respond or result in casualties of catastrophic proportions. In comparing imminence in 1837, it's like comparing imminence in 1837 during the, during the Caroline doctrines, uh, during the Caroline event, to imminence in 2003. Similarly, it's like comparing correspondence between Daniel Webster and Lord Ashburton to instant messages between Colin Powell and French Foreign Minister Villepin. Furthermore, as my supporting colleague suggested, and as Joseph Nye has so aptly put, the logic of deterrence does not work without a return address. That's, that's why targeting rogue regimes is important, even when they have veto welding friends on the Security Council. It also exposed the assumption of rationality. Concer rogue regimes are not concerned with their territorial integrity necessarily, or their sovereignty, and that is even more true for uh, international terrorists. We're not, we're not likely to see international rogue regimes take the path of Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Germany, Italy, and Sweden, and turn their back from the siren call of national nuclear programs. Put, put it simply, the game theoretical framework for irrationality does not apply to rogue regimes and does not apply to international terrorists, because they don't play by the rules to begin with. Iraq didn't respond to condemning 17 condemning uh, resolutions from the Security Council, and Al-Qaeda has not stopped because of 1387 to 13, whatever, whatever have you. I'm sure they'll clarify that for me. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> expose the assumptions of equality. 9-11 firmed the primacy of the United States in its, in its unique position in the inter international arena. International law in regards to the use of force and self-defense must match the political realities of the international system or be rendered void. The United States undoubtedly remains a lone superpower, and its people, territory, and interests are the specific targets of rogue regimes and international terrorists. For international law to deny the United States the world's most powerful actor the ability to act to a credible, imminent, and overwhelming threat would be to render the international law to absurdity, to attempt for the United States to, roll, to, to, slowly, to rely solely on the bureaucratic debates with the Security Council and its weakened resolutions would be absurdity on stilts. Absutes in law should be firm, but rare, like prohibitions against genocide and slavery. However, the law of use of force must necessarily be flexible or be deemed irrelevant, suffering the fate of the League of Nations. 
And uh, wishing to close this time, close my time, I will take the advice that Jacques Chirac is quick to give but slow to follow. I will not miss a good opportunity to keep quiet. Madam Speaker, members of the House, right goal, wrong means. But before I get to uh, the policy consequences of what I see as an aberrant policy of the United States, let me, with all due respect to my colleagues, correct one small, perhaps two small errors. First of all, you just heard a reference to the 1981 attack by the Israeli Air Force, an excellent tactical strike involving four F-15 fighter jets flying, perhaps better than the United States itself could fly, took out with tremendous effect the nuclear power facility at Osirak. What my respected opponent forgot to mention to you is that in the United Nations Security Council, when that matter was considered, it resulted in a resolution of condemnation of 15 to 0, including a vote by the United States of condemnation. So I question <coughs> how the United States can now seek to reverse its vote of condemnation on exactly the same principle that my colleague suggests is applicable now. <coughs> I, I'm also a bit confused, perhaps you are as well, with this concept of the, the nexus between the horrendous attacks on, this, on the United States in New York and Washington in September of 1991, uh, attacks which rendered the United States a victim in the worst possible circumstances and, and which drew universal, a universal support from our country and from every other country of the world. But somehow this attempt to draw a nexus, a linkage between Al-Qaeda attacks in the United States and Saddam Hussein's regime puzzles me. I can find no factual predicate for Al-Qaeda being in league with Saddam Hussein and his regime. As a matter of fact, all the credible evidence and even the CIA analysts who speak on this issue suggest there is not a linkage. And the only terrorist camp in which any kind of connection with Al-Qaeda was found was in North Iraq under the control of the Kurdish faction, not Saddam Hussein. So <coughs> perhaps, perhaps uh, our worthy opponents can help me to understand that a little better. Let me suggest first and foremost a concern which the Americans seem to have forgotten in invoking this as the clear legal predicate for the use of force. And again, I would reiterate what my colleague Professor Byers said so well. We seek not to argue that the use of force in Iraq is not appropriate. It is appropriate. But it is the means, the legal foundation and the policy foundation which troubles us particularly when the linkage which we in Britain felt so strongly about between 678 of 1990, 687 of 1991, and 1441 of last fall do provide a clear policy and legal predicate for the justified use of force, which, as we all know, is being quite successful in Iraq. But this tool which the United States seeks to weave into customary international law is not a tool for the United States alone to use. Because as you know better than I, as you develop customary international law, it is not just American. It is not just British. It is customary international law, which exists throughout the entire international community and can be used by any country against any other country. Now, our opponents would suggest, surely, that would not happen. Are we so assured of that? 
Have you not read in the papers about what North Korea is doing of late? Are we so convinced that Iran, that China, that North Korea, that India, that Pakistan, that none of those countries would seek not to use this policy? We've already heard but three and a half weeks ago that Japan, in a statement regarding the potential threat of North Korea, said what? It would use force preemptively if it in any way considered that the North Koreans were planning an attack. That sounds strikingly like what I read in the Americans' National Security Strategy document of last September. Our opponents suggested that we should throw the United Nations and the United Nations Security Council in the trash can. I think that states it far too strongly. This United Nations Security Council, this United Nations Charter, which the United States has always maintained we believe in, this has been the fundamental arbiter of the use of force for the last 50 years. Are we suggesting that it does not have problems in the veto? No, we've not. We're suggesting that when you remove the international arbiter of the use of force, it becomes, as our Americans are fond of saying, perhaps a shootout at the OK Corral. <laughs> and whose aim is better? Who has the biggest gun? Are we willing to let the international community reverse what's been the attempt of all rational people over the last 50 years to preclude? The doctrine also if allowed unchecked, which is what our opponents would suggest in their argument, creates tremendous problems for our coalition, for the United States and the United Kingdom. In trying to maintain some type of allied support among our coalition of the willing, not just in the conflict which still goes on, but in post-conflict Iraq. Do we understand the cost in manpower, in British pounds, in American dollars, of what it will require if we, as an occupation force, under international law, the Geneva Conventions, the Fourth Geneva Convention, if we are obligated to restore public safety, restore order, and then rebuild Iraq, which is what we say we ought to do? Have we counted the cost of going it alone, which is what our opponents suggest we are doing and should do in future countries? The Americans, American Secretary of Defense has all but suggested that Syria is next on the list, and then perhaps Iran. I think I should warn the Canadian Prime Minister that he may be fourth on the list. <laughs> Not only does it weaken the possible support that we might have from our allies, but I would suggest it also gives license to those who would seek to do us harm. The United States and Britain have historically, and rightfully so, had a reputation for leadership in the international community. If we characterize ourselves by our actions, that we seek unilaterally to affect regime changes wherever we feel we, not the international community, deem it appropriate, then it seems to me that if we do have a concern for terrorism, and again, terrorism does not equate to a linkage with Iraq, but if we do have a concern for terrorism and terrorist attacks not only on our two countries, but every other country in the world, then we fuel the resentment, the hatred, and the perception of arrogance that now clearly exists, not just among the Arab community world, but among many other countries. So in closing, let me suggest again, the use of force in Iraq is certainly appropriate. The goal is proper and right and morally justified. The means are where the error lies. Thank you.
I'd like to approach the rebuttal really quickly. I hope those are all walking out the American door. <laughs> that is no cow. No. <laughs> but uh, for the sake of uh, finishing the rebuttal, we'll all assume not. I'd like to bring up a few points that we uh, were brought up in this debate. The United Kingdom argues that the threat isn't imminent under Caroline, that the United States waited four months. Under that theory, we waited for Al Qaeda for 10 years. The question is not when they strike. It's when they get the capability to strike. Al Qaeda was ready to strike before September 11th. The fact that Americans are brave and put their lives on risk each day is a testament to their fortitude and not of an invalidation of the Caroline precedent. What we have essentially is the belief that international law means that there is a capability for imminent threat that leaves no deliberation. And that is what is at stake. They bring up Osiric. Yes, 15 to 0 did condemn it. But 20 years later, if they had seen Saddam Hussein had used chemical weapons at Halabja, had used chemical weapons against the Iranians, maybe it wouldn't be 15 to 0. And that was a point we made out very early in our case. We mentioned the facts about the Hussein regime, how atrocious it is, how it has violated international commitments, and that is why. It's amazing that the Israelis were incredibly prescient. Unfortunately, we didn't have that gift at that time. But the fact is, now we do. We know what type of man Saddam Hussein is, and it is valid. My partner has pointed out the flaws of the Security Council with the cheese-eating surrender monkeys, or the French, as some like to call them. <laughs> now, the issue here is not that only self-defense is why self-defense matters so much, is it also preserves one other right. When the Security Council fails, the inherent right of self-defense remains. And there will be times the Security Council has failed. It has failed a lot in the last 50 years, as my colleague noted. And when it still does, you will always have that inherent right of self-defense. They point out there is no link to terror, although the fact that Zaka Wahiri was walking around Baghdad might prove otherwise. We're going to excuse that and point out that not all evils are linked. Fascism and communism wasn't linked. But that doesn't mean when you see evil, you don't confront it. You confront it head on. They point out that other states may invoke it. They say, look at Japan. I'm not too worried about Japan invoking self-defense, because we stated something very clear in our opening argument, that we are abiding by the other international commitments. If China tomorrow says it's going to invade Taiwan and obey Geneva 4 and all the other laws of wars, I will be surprised to hear it. I'll be surprised to hear North Korea say it. I don't think you will hear that. Please call me when they do. They argue that we are putting other states on notice. We support that factor. Yes, yeah, Syria and Iran, you are on notice. If you become Saddam Hussein's, if you become states that will acquire weapons of mass destruction and threaten others with it, creating an imminent danger to others, you will be on the list. But if you act responsibly, if you act like dedicated states, respect the international norms, international order, then you have nothing to fear. And that's why preventive self, preemptive self-defense is so important. If you act responsibly, you have nothing to fear. Because the rights, as we elucidated, are a high standard. It took a gross warmonger like Saddam Hussein to satisfy them. Now they also point out in the, their last argument that there's an issue of resentment. Well, a lot of people do hate us. But I've noticed over the last few days, and you may have too, that the cheering crowds in Basra are not uh, among them. That when we have evil states, and when the international community fails to take action, and we, when we preserve our basic rights, take action, we may actually do something positive. War is expensive, both in blood and treasure. It's not something states are going to do easily. But when there is an imminent danger, and as in this case, we preserve a right of self-defense, is important. It makes sure that the international community is stable. And by doing so, International law becomes not a shield for the corrupt, but a weapon for the worthy. And that is the case before us here. Do we sit idly by or do we stand strong? It has been the tradition of the United States to confront challenges since its existence, and it will do so today. It will endure, it will survive, and it will prevail. Thank you. This is a very serious issue at a very serious time in world politics where freedom-loving democratic countries need to stand together. Cheese-eating surrender monkeys. A country that is central to US international trade. A key member of NATO in the defense of the North Atlantic region. A country that this country 
owes a great deal to for its support of the revolution in 1776. The cultural contributions of France to American culture, and the list goes on and on. You do not make fun of important allies. You do not make fun of friends, even when you disagree with them. This is too serious for that kind of language. And what of the French veto? What of this unreasonable veto? My country, the United Kingdom, has cast 32 vetoes in the Security Council since 1945. France undoubtedly thought that some of those were unreasonable, but it doesn't change the law. We have the right to veto. The United Kingdom has the right to veto, and we have done it 32 times. The United States has done it far more often. It's not illegal. You don't make fun of people. You don't circumvent international law because a country believes that it's casting the veto is in its national interest. That's why the veto is there. We also make the point, again, that we don't need the support of France now to go to war. We needed the support of France on November 6, 2002, in Resolution 1441. And the support of France was there. What we disagreed with over France was whether or not the weapons inspections were yielding fruit and should be allowed to continue. That was the disagreement, not the fact that Saddam Hussein was a threat, not the fact that force might well have to be taken against him. It was a disagreement over timing. But the authorization was given on November 6, 2002. Clear authorization, as I argued. Also, the British government, we have to say, entered into this war with some reluctance. We wanted a further resolution from the Security Council. We wanted the issue to be put to the vote. We wanted France to be allowed to come on side. We wanted Russia to be there with us. The United States, of course, insisted that no vote be put to the Security Council last month. Why? Because they wanted to use preemptive self-defense. We think the Security Council is there. We think the Security Council might well have supported us. We think there was sufficient authorization in 1441, and we want to keep the UN involved, including in the post-war situation. Finally, I want to speak to a disturbing thread that has been in the argument put forward by our good opponents. And this is their repeated referral to the fact that countries won't use this doctrine of preemptive self-defense because it would be militarily suicide for them to do so, that we can rely on deterrence and the fact that we're the big guys. Well, perhaps we can. But it's a dangerous and inefficient way of governing the world. There are neighborhoods in this city, Durham, North Carolina, where there's not much in the way of the rule of law, where force and threats and willingness to kill is what keeps some people on top and others not. The powerful actors in the poor neighborhoods of Durham, North Carolina, the leaders of the gangs, have an average life expectancy of 35 years. It's a dangerous way to run a society, anarchy, and the lack of a rule of law. We don't want that internationally. Yes, we could probably do it. Yes, we're probably powerful enough. Yes, we can. But we don't want that. And finally, on the last point, the question of arrogance. I come from the United Kingdom, a country that was a superpower a country that was exceedingly arrogant in the 18th century, a country that this country rebelled against because of that arrogance. Don't make the mistake that we made. Don't surrender your international goodwill. Do not presume to know what is right for others. This is a great country, the United States, and it can stay a great country, but it needs to behave as if it is a member of a community and not make the mistake that the United Kingdom did. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Patel, Mr. Allman, Professor Silliman, and Professor Byers. I now introduce a motion for closure and a vote upon the question before this House. Based upon what you heard, I ask this House to leave and vote accordingly. So, American door, UK door. Thank you. 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 Thank you.